Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello, and welcome back to the Black and Design Conference. Um, my name, yeah. <laughs> Um, my name is Natasha Hicks. And my name is Armando Sullivan. We're two of the organizers of this year's conference, along with Amanda Miller, Marcus Mello, and Chanel Williams. Uh, thank you again for joining us here bright and early on the second day of the Black Design Conference, Designing Resistance, Building Coalitions. Uh, we're excited to build upon the inaugural conference in 2015, and we wanted to take a moment to thank the organizing committee from 2015 who created this amazing platform. That includes the co-chairs from 2015, Courtney Sharp and Kara Michelle, as well as the committee members Azura Cox, Shawnee uh, Carter, Dana McKinney, Fallon Samuels, Catherine Curiel, and Megan Eccles. Yes. Our conference mission is twofold, highlighting designers of the African diaspora and unearthing the agency and unique skills that designers hold to envision more radical and equitable futures, both within and beyond the traditional definitions of design. At the previous conference, we unearthed the capacity and power of a network of black and brown designers. We invited individuals that identify with all aspects of design, ranging from artists to policymakers. With the intention to continue forming and building coalitions, the conference is organized around four conversations exploring and visualizing identities, communicating values, mobilizing and organizing, and design futuring. By bringing a wide-ranging group together in conversation around these themes, we hope today's discussions reveal how design is creating spaces for action and representations of resistance. Last night, we began the conversation around exploring and visualizing identities with an insightful talk from Hamza Walker about his exhibition, Black Is, Black Ain't. We're looking forward to hearing from the amazing group of speakers during the sessions today, as well as hearing from our closing keynote by DeRay McKesson, moderated by Barika Williams. We encourage you to think about how the conference is only a starting point to an exploration of designers as advocates and activists. And we'll hopefully deeply investigate collective action items tomorrow at the Just City Lab workshop. The conference would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors, and we would like to extend a special thanks the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. We are also grateful for financial support from the Graduate School of Design's various administration, staff, and gracious faculty who have encouraged us throughout the planning process and are recognized in the program. We are also appreciative of the Hideo Sasaki Foundation, um, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Loeb Fellowship, as well as the Just City Lab, who is supporting and facilitating Sunday's workshop. We also wanted to highlight a couple of exciting opportunities for you during the program today. First, please participate in our Real Talk exhibition um, as, we, as we advance the importance of the African diaspora in design. You can take your photo directly behind Piper Auditorium. Um, second, make sure you check out the Shallow Shelf exhibition in the Loeb Library featuring books from our speakers, um, books from our speakers and in the Loeb Library's African American Architects Design Nexus, which you can hear more about uh, tonight at the reception. Uh, finally, you can check out the Harvard Art Museum today, complimentary with your Black and Design name tag. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Make sure you use our hashtags right up here as you're tweeting, Facebooking, Instagramming the conference today. Um, and now Marcus Mello will introduce the first session. Hello. Our first session, Exploring and Visualizing Identities, approaches understanding our own personal narratives and values as the foundation of designing re resistance. Through the act of visualizing and representing our ideals and values, we continue to reveal our agency. Our session participants today are Sekou Cook, a Harvard Graduate School of Design and Cornell University educated, Jamaican born practitioner and educator. <laughs> he is currently an assistant professor at Syracuse University's School of Architecture, and his research centers around full-scale prototyping techniques in the emergent field of hip-hop architecture. Brandon Bro is a fine artist and designer working out of Chicago. His creative experience is comprised of painting, sculpture, web, video, print, and interactive projects. 
Widely known as the artist behind all three of Chance the Rapper's iconic album covers, Brandon's art focuses on identity, the subconscious mind, and the fragility of the human psyche. Dr. Dr. Courtney D. Cogburn is an assistant professor at the Columbia University School of Social Work. Her research focuses broadly on the role of racism in producing racial inequities in health, including recent collaboration with Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. The session will be moderated by Tao Tavengwa, current Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of, De of Design. Please give a warm welcome to our first speaker, Sekou Cook. All right, first one. Let's get it started. All right, um, so uh, first of all, um, this is, this is really kind of special for me personally because this is a, a space that I'm familiar with. Um, this is a building and an auditorium that I'm familiar with. I've never been behind this lectern before, so um, we'll see how this goes. Um, thanks to uh, Marcus, Natasha, and, Am and Amanda for putting together, to, for bringing all of us here. Um, I'm really honored to, to be kicking this off and presenting first. Thanks to the rest of the GSD AASU. This is a group that uh, I was a member of uh, while I was here um, in its second year of existence. Um, and uh, some of you may remember, in its third year of existence, we were, um, we were uh, part of the group that, that brought Kanye here uh, to the GSD. So that's part of, part of our claim to fame. Um, uh, and, and that moment was actually uh, the moment that got me started off on this trajectory uh, in, um, to do with hip hop architecture. And uh, because it was this, this really important thing that, that we thought could have such a broader impact within the profession of architecture specifically. Um, and you know, got, got some of my first pieces published around that. Um, so where I want to start here is um, with uh, another kind of starting point for this work on hip hop architecture, which is uh, the work that Kara Walker did in her work in her um, in her uh, in her group gallery show called Roughneck Constructivist, and um, this is where I grounded a lot of the attitude behind my research on hip hop architecture. Um, that she was bringing together a group of visual artists, but, but was, was pr proposing a manifesto searching for a movement that was about architecture and about um, antisocial, roughneck, hip hop, rude boy ethos. So, um, and in, the, uh, in, the, in the, the catalog for that show, um, Craig Wilkins also had um, a pretty uh, impactful uh, essay in that called Queer Ass Architecture. Um, where he talks about the different modes of space that, that architects can operate within. Um, and the, the final one of those spaces being um, we'll just steal space. And this is the space that the roughneck really wants to occupy. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the two main um, theoretical underpinnings of hip hop architecture. And then I'll talk about one project because that's all time that I have here. Um, so the, the, the first fundamental is, is about the fact that you can't really talk about hip hop with, without talking about its architecturally specific origins. So, um, so uh, there's a conversation that I was having with someone else when I presented some of this work where we were saying that we can't really talk about urbanism without talking about hip hop and you can't talk about hip hop without talking about urbanism. So they're inherently connected in their roots. Um, and, and I've recently wrote another piece about the, the oppressive grid that will hopefully get published pretty soon. Um, and the, the relationship of, of uh, black people in this country with the grid has always been kind of a, an oppressive one. So if you think about um, public housing, public schools and prisons all kind of share this, this common um, uh, archetypal uh, space. Um, and this is the dominant conditions under which hip hop itself kind of uh, emerged. The, the second part of the, the theoretical underpinning of this is that um, you know, uh, in, in Western, in, in all major cultural, um, cultural movements in Western civilization, uh, 
there, there, there has been um, uh, creative output in five major spaces, or as I put it in, um, in uh, the fifth pillar, um, each major cultural era in Western society, the Renaissance, the Baroque, modernism, and lists a plurality of creative outlets, theater, music, dance, fine art, and architecture. The first four art forms find their counterparts in the four pillars of hip hop, DJing, MCing, b-boying, and graffiti, but architecture is somehow lost. Um, okay, so I'll go into the, the, the one thread of some of the research that I'm, I've been doing right now, um, which is on hip hop technology. There's other pieces that I'm actually not gonna talk about right now. Um, the work that I've done in DC with, with Thor Nelson, who's here, and Eric, Eric uh, Shaw, um, uh, we can talk about another time, but right now I'm going to show actually some some unpublished work that um, where it, it's really important to me where th this this point where I'm I'm kind of making uh, uh, an intentional shift from the theoretical to the the practical where I'm actually testing some of these things in in my own studio and um, uh, I'll I'll drop a quote from Erica Badu here where you know where she says. Uh, in her, on her live album, um, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit. So, um, <laughs> so uh, let's, let's, let's see how that goes. Um, so uh, so this, the, the beginning of the premise of, of hip hop architectural technology is that seeing the DJs as like the original hackers of technology, where they kind of put all together all of these um, seemingly um, very advanced technological pieces in a, in a kind of like, um, collage way, and uh, the, the first DJs did exactly what you're not supposed to do with this phonographic technology, which is they put their fingers on the records. So um, if you ever grew up in a household that had records, you know that you're not, never supposed to touch them at all. Um, and then um, in, in this space, uh, actually here in, 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 um, at the Black and Design Conference two years ago, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Erica Nwankwo from from Autodesk, and, and Autodesk helped to fund some of this, this research. Um, and uh, so it's, it's about like mixing this analog inputs with the digital outputs. Um, and the first part of it was about, was, was funding um, student work in a seminar that I did a year ago, and having them push the boundaries of some of the digital fabrication tools that we use all the time in architecture, so here, um, uh, thinking about the, the, what happens when you, you uh, tweak the digital inputs to emphasize analog distortions. Um, this is like minimizing support materials for 3D prints and all the weird things that come out of that. And then what if you kind of overwhelm or break um, the, the built-in methodologies, the, these d d digital methodologies. So, um, this one was based on the one question, what happens if you laser cut uh, non-planar surfaces? Um, so we get all these different catalogs of effects. Um, and, and so my own um, work that continued into the summer was about uh, taking the 3D printer, um, these really cheap uh, kind of $200 3D printers so that we could um, experiment with them more, more openly and break them if we needed to. Um, and, and use them in, in ways that are similar to, to how the DJ was using them in early on. So this is what my uh, studio looked like for most of the, the summer. And, um, and uh, so the, the nozzle is just kind of moving in the X direction and the print bed is moving in the Y direction. So how can we disrupt that with a series of analog inputs? So we started with the, the scratch um, and we identified a series of different uh, hip hop DJing techniques. Um, we focused on three of them, so the scratch is the first one, and we started with the cube as this kind of, um, again, the, this, this grid, this quintessential primitive that we're all exposed to all the time, and we want to kind of disrupt that grid. Um, and we wanted to understand that in also a non-abstract way. So what is it like as a physical construction? Um, what are the, the, the support materials when it's being printed out from the, from the, um, from the 3D printer? And then we, we just kind of really just, just shift it. We scratch it. So we, we, we disrupt the, the nozzle as it's printing, or in this case, we disrupt the, the bed in the opposite direction, and then we draw what that looks like. And then we also tweak the inputs um, 
so just fit, just print the, the fill itself um, in, in, in either direction or the, um, or the shell itself, the shell only. Um, I guess two. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a timer right here. Uh, uh, and then, so the second one was, was the, the spin where um, we actually try to, we have to create uh, a new bed because the, the, the bed doesn't want to move in, in rotation. So we actually create a second bed on top of the, the, the initial bed to do that. And we have to make sure it conducts heat and so forth. So this is what we're, we're doing to um, you know, actually create this other bed and then kind of manipulate it as it's printing out. And then we get some of these, these weird things out of it, um, the fill only. And then here's what it looks like in the shell only. Um, and then the second one was the cross. The third one is the cross fade. So we're now mixing different inputs to create the, the singular output. Um, and uh, this is what some of that stuff starts to look like. And it all produces this um, larger matrix of things that um, we start to understand. Um, and the last part of this is, is how do we now project into the applicability of it. And there are several potential starting points. Um, again, I can't, don't have the time to give too much context, but we kind of dive dove in and say, uh, this, this area on the south side of Syracuse that is going through a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, demolition, there's a lot of kind of blight in the neighborhood, so what do we do with that? So a lot of the fabric kind of looks like this. Um, and there's this history that the, 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 the area has of um, this, this really deep African-American history that was kind of preserved in this preservation project a few years before. And we wanted to use this technique to kind of reveal some of those and tie it back to hip hop's potential for uncovering and revealing um, unknown histories. So we do the same kind of process where we print out the, 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 the primitives, now the houses themselves, and um, that generates some of the uh, similar kind of things like that. So that's what they start to look like in drawing form. Um, and uh, you know, with the fill only, um, and the crossfade, and the shell only, and you get these burnout moments, which are kind of fascinating. Um, and then a, a, a matrix of, of all of that. And then we propose, okay, now when you put it all together, um, this is what, uh, this is kind of how we're proposing um, uh, a kind of active demolition of, of the pieces before they just get flattened to the, to the ground and they can become like a resource in the neighborhood instead of just being a, a blight. So this is kind of connected to, um, you know, you know, theoretically connecting now to some work of Gordon, Gordon Matta Clark or some of these weird uh, images that you get from Philip Desjardins, Desjardins or um, uh, Xavier Delory, who I'm just now um, uh, uh, familiarizing myself with. And um, even going back to some of my own, um, my own work back in my undergraduate thesis from almost 20 years ago now. Um, uh, some of those same methodologies. And I'll end right now, last slide. Um, uh, so, so uh, and to talk about why this matters on a bigger level, especially when we talk about identities. And uh, this, this last piece that I was saying that I wrote about the oppressive grid um, is also looking at the um, uh, modernism and postmodernism as these uh, tools for um, extracting, deliberately extracting identity from architecture, wiping it, wiping the, clay, the, sweat, the slate clean. Um, but um, we, as as people of the uh, people of color um, of the African diaspora, can't exist without identity, and architecture itself can't it exist without identity. So, um, the kind of summarizing quote from that is: um, if architecture continues to perpetuate the false assumption that its most basic tools are neutral, it will fail to address its malignant lack of diversity and remain mired in rhetorical comparisons between subtle shades of gray. That's it. Thanks. Now, welcome, Brandon. Hello. I have to take a picture before I start. This is 
a little surreal to me, and I need to capture this. So, all right. Uh, wait till we get loaded up. My name is uh, Brandon Bro. I am a uh, designer artist based in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to wait for a second until I, uh, okay, there we go. Hi, I'm Brandon. Um, so yeah, I'm based in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Um, designer, artist, started out as an artist, as a, as a youngin, and um, I chose to do design for uh, security reasons and uh, warnings of family, like we don't want you to be a starving artist. You probably need to do something with computers. So you should try this graphic design thing. Uh, so that's how it, it started. Um, uh, I'm going to go a little bit about my background, and I'm going to get into some, some work that I've uh, been doing lately, and then past work too, and then also what that journey was like a little bit, like the process was for me. Uh, so backstory, it's family photos. Um, so I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, I wasn't born or raised with my father. Um, my mom's a single mom. My father was uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia two days before I was born. So in, in an incident that was like a kind of a life or family path changing incident that really shook a lot of uh, things up for us. Um, but it greatly impacted the, um, the future of the family. And um, my mom was a single mom. We, we had a lot of support because she had a huge family. She had uh, seven other brothers and sisters. So I did have a lot of support growing up. Um, but mental health uh, like, and, and mental illness has been something that I've seen since I was a kid and not a whole lot of conversation about it. So I make it a point to talk about it in my work. This is my dad. Uh, yeah. um, so I want to get into art and culture, I guess now. So for me, art was something that I started doing at a very young age, before I can remember. I have uh, drawings from way, way back. Um, and it was me kind of depicting my family, me drawing my family, very early stages. Uh, it was always something that, uh, that I had for myself that I would do to escape. Um, and but around the time I got into around high school, I was dealing with a little bit of depression. And for me, I needed a form to express myself physically aloud in front of people. Um, that's, that's what I kept, I kept feeling. So initially, martial arts was the thing that I wanted to really get in, into. But that came with money for classes. <laughs> so. Um, what that ended up looking like for me was, um, well, martial arts, and I found capoeira. If people know what capoeira is, it's like a Brazilian uh, art form. Martial art, dance as well. But from there, um, I got into hip hop because capoeira was really similar to hip hop. And hip hop was this thing that didn't necessarily have all of these rules around it as much, and you can teach yourself. So I didn't need to pay anybody to teach me how to break dance. So uh, we taught ourselves how to break dance. We uh, rented videos and Beat Street on repeat. We rented it every weekend uh, until, we, until we learned how to do swipes, until we learned how to do six steps and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, these, this image is just like um, my early representations of art from like the hip hop side of things and that, you know, that art in a sense. And also around that time, I uh, got introduced to studio classes and what real art classes and art school stuff was. So I was a part of this program at the um, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. It's called the Early College Program. And it put us, like young kids, in courses with adults to learn stuff about art. And uh, for me, it was great because it put language behind a lot of things that I was doing or trying to do anyway. And it gave me a way to, to be able to um, address and broaden and deepen my understanding about these principles of art 
stuff like that. So SIC was, was a great place for that. Around that time, I was break dancing too, so I would show up to class and all Adidas, and I have like my Kango on, <laughs> and I was, you know, I was like 14 or something, but I was really, really into it. Uh, so, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, so in between there and me transitioning to my professional life and uh, college and that whole thing, um, was me kind of figuring out that I was kind of going into some spaces that weren't, wasn't necessarily, or weren't necessarily designed for me in every way possible, right? So being an artist, one, and Compr like, I don't want to say compromising, but choosing graphic design as the field to go into was um, me fitting myself sort of in a space that I didn't necessarily want to be in. So in college, I just worked on poster designs the whole time I was in college. And when I came out, you know, I had a, I, my portfolio was full of poster designs, so I, I didn't get a job immediately. So um, <laughs> it, was, it was difficult, but I was constantly rebelling against, like, trying to find my own path and trying to write my own story throughout this, this whole time. And um, what I found, I'm really glad I did that stuff. I'm really glad I'm, um, I, we did that and we began to work, to, you know, began to work with other people in the community, other artists around me. That's how I got introduced into doing all of the album cover art that I did eventually anyway. So I have five minutes to talk. So I'm gonna start going through some of the work that I've done and the stuff that I'm doing right now recently, just to show you guys some of this stuff. Our Chicago is a ship, is, was a, an art show that I did in collaboration with Bud Light. I know it's like really random, but um, <laughs> Bud Light came to me like I think the beginning of this year and they asked me to design a, a Chicago summer bottle for like their Lollapalooza efforts and all of their summer efforts. So, you know, I said, cool, but we need to do something cool on the other end of this so that I actually care about doing like, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's pretty much what it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they were great. I mean, they were great in the whole process. But I mean, that, that helps. You know, I think we, we take on a lot of work that like that is you know is is great great opportunities. But we still have still feel a little unfulfilled, and still more to be said, right? So our solution to this was at the launch event for the bottle we just did an art show, and we talked and I talked about what Chicago meant for me. And I expressed that, and it was very fulfilling. And that was the part of the project that I, you know, I'm most in love with now, even. So I'm gonna let me click through some of that. So this was the the bottle that I did. That's better pictures of it. It was like all over Lollapalooza. It was everywhere. It's kind of crazy seeing it uh, everywhere, and everyone with it in their hand when they're walking around. Um, and the the art that I created for it was art that that really spoke to my experience in Chicago, and I, I chose to. Um, approach it from beer brands uh, affinity for neon signage. They love neon signage, right? So a lot of the pieces I broke down as if they were sort of neon signs and Harold's Chicken is like a, a, um, a you know, yeah, there we go, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, yeah, it's, just, it's a hallmark, you know, place and I talked about 79th Street. Um, Kerry James Marshall portrait is in there. Um, Virgil Abloh portrait is in there. Pride cleaners on 79th Street. Just sh real Chicago things. My Chicago, as I as I see it. Um, I mean, this is some of the neon lights uh, uh, installations that I built for the show as well. The whole self portrait with the Bud Light logo over my face, like really dealing with this idea of selling out. This idea of like logo slapping, <laughs> really like literally. So yeah. Um, there's some more stuff. Some elements. I did some po a lot of poster designs, a lot of different things. Um, these are some poster designs. A lot of it inspired by Warhol's work that he did with Coca-Cola back in the day. And it was just um, it was the easiest end for me to really have people take this art seriously or this design seriously by um, tying it into pop art and tying it into some other things that people had an idea about and have sort of seen before, but just position it and present it in a new way from my lens through my lens. Um, this is the T-shirts we designed kind of like broke down that poster graphic on the left um, to like a neon sign, more of a simple, simple form. But it was, it was successful. A lot of people really loved the, the stuff. I did some glasses, some tumblers for them. Um, there's some other posters, stuff I did, some real pop art vibe stuff. Uh, and then they, they wrapped the design on trains and they like made blankets and they like, <laughs> they, 
they did like beer brand stuff with the, and it's like, okay, cool, you know, my, my signature is like three feet on the side of a train, all right, let's go, you know. Um, so now I want to get into um, mental health is real. It's, um, it, it's a graphic I made, and it was a piece that I created actually to um, be a part of the Our Chicago show. I wanted to speak about that part, but I didn't really necessarily be able to get into that deeply at the show because alcoholism is considered a, a mental illness, it can be, so there's a little bit of a gray area for um, Bud Light. They didn't want to do that, of course. but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, I made the shirts afterwards and, and just kind of doing it on its on this own thing. And I've been, I've been putting uh, trademarked or registered behind a, a lot of things to just make them a brand um, because I think it's funny and fun. Um, so yeah, um, the, here's, here are the pieces, Mental Health is Real Tees. We did some hats as well. Um, that's a random composition I did in my studio. All right, now chance work time stuff. Okay, so. Um, Chance the Rapper is a musician from Chicago, <laughs> like nobody knows that. <laughs> so he, it's, it's, it's funny, um, we, hip hop community in, in this community of artists is really small and tight knit. So some of his mentors and people that he looked up to, Brother Mike was somebody that, that he looked up to, was a, a poet and a well known uh, advocate and supporter, educator for kids at that time. Anyway. We had a lot of people in common, like we're years apart, but we had a lot of people in common, we had culture in common, and that's what kind of brought us together. And um, I, I really wish we saw the value of that a lot more, the value of a lot of things we have within, within our communities, like every culture, you know, there's, there's a lot of inherent value there. A lot of times um, we get seduced or feeling like we need to look outside of ourselves to find these things and, and all this, but the most meaningful works that I've done in my life like have happened less than a mile away from my home, like with people that grew up in the same area that are doing things like less than a mile away from where I stay. So color stories, this is kind of to get into, with this project, we, you know, this talk is about identity. We use uh, these colors, I, I, unintentionally and intentionally sometimes use these colors to identify these different projects um, and how they live through space, like online in this digital space. And it was really successful. A lot of people really took to, took to a lot of the work, and I don't have a whole lot of time to speak into it, but hopefully, you know, we, we can speak some more on, on the panel. Um, so these are the works. Um, Field Trip is another program that I'm doing. It's just renting a bus and taking kids to the art museum to kind of show them art, because they haven't been to the MCA. They don't know who Murakami is, and, I'm, and I went to the show, and the first thing I thought was like, as many kids in Chicago need to see this as possible. So I started renting bus and having people sponsored to rent buses to take kids to the museum to see Murakami. And it's, it's up to them what they do with that. We, never, we don't really know where that inspiration is going, to, is going to take them. But just planting the seed is, is really important. It's another photo from there. Our friend Albert, who uh, le leads tours at the MCA, helped out with that too. Um, back to some of the Bud Light work I did. I'm going to skip for that though. Keep going. Post grad life, not gonna talk about that right now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, this is some of the early works that I did, and you can see like the, how this stuff kind of evolved into like the chance work and the other works that I, I ended up doing. This is my first digital painting piece, and then after that, I started doing like the chance works. This was the piece that kind of led to the chance work. Um, I did a couple of covers back in like 2008, and uh, they ended up on popular blogs. and. People didn't know who did the art and stuff like that. So then it became a mission to inform people about artists and have artists not uh, take these back seats when it comes to popular culture and popular art. Um, more stuff, some oil paintings I've, I've done. More oil, oil painting on the left and the jacket I did on the right. Some sweatshirt I designed and the oil painting on the right. Um, more stuff designed by um, one of my creative partners, Dugan Kim, over there on the left, he designed these two graphics for this, this collection. Um, more oil, oil and digital. Digital, S yeah, handles. So yeah, <laughs> um, that, that's it, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'd like to invite Courtney up to speak next. 
Hello, everyone. So I'm going to wrap up our, our session um, and talk about some of my work. Um, and I just have to say, I understand why Brandon took a picture. This is a beautiful ass room. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Um, so I, as they, as they load the video, um, I'll just want to say that uh, I am a psychologist, um, but really think of myself as a transdisciplinary scholar. I did my postdoctoral work here at Harvard. I live just a few blocks away and will walk by this building all the time and never came in. So it's such a joy to actually be in the room with you now. Um, and also to make a statement about the importance of culture in the work that I do and the work that we all do and really believe that racial oppression is most frequently and effectively fought on cultural terrain. And so that really is the root of, of the work that I do. So I'm talking to you today about a project where we're thinking about ways to immerse people in experiences of racism through virtual reality. <clears throat> it really relies us to think about what we mean by what racism is. I often find in our public discourse that we're quite narrow and limited in what we think we're talking about when we're talking about racism. Even when we talk about white supremacy, we think about people in hoods or even maybe white polos carrying torches in Charlottesville, where I went to college. Um, but racism uh, is not just whether you would show up to a meeting or not, or whether you would put on a hood, right? That kind of leads us to the statement about whether we are as an individual a racist or not. And I am not especially interested in whether people have an individual designation of being racist. You, you, know, you probably are. You grew up in the United States of America, and you don't get a pass or a special button that says that you're not, and that somehow gives you a pass from being anti-racist. Right, so being actively involved and engaging in the fight against racist and oppressive systems. So I want to sort of expand our view of what we think of when we're talking about racism. I focus on cultural racism, so really thinking of any form of cultural communication that conveys a sense of white superiority and that devalues, dehumanizes, and diminishes the significance of anyone who is not white. This shows up in various ways, right? So this is in our Halloween costumes, white men dressed as Trayvon Martin as a joke for Halloween. This is one of many images I collected this year, that year, uh, who, people who thought that this was funny. It shows up in our language, right? Paul Ryan referring to lazy inner city men in relation to poverty, but also citing a scholar who believes that blacks are genetically inferior. Paul Ryan didn't say blacks were genetically inferior. He cited a scholar who said it in the context of saying lazy inner city men. It's rooted in actually deliberate strategy, right? This is not uh, coincidental, I would argue. This is a quote from Lee Atwater, a key strategist under Reagan, who was secretly recorded saying, you start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts you, it backfires. So you say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff and you're getting so abstract. And all of these you're talking about are totally economic things, and a byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this, it's much more abstract than even the busing thing, and a hell of a lot more abstract than nigger nigger. So Paul Ryan saying lazy inner city men is a strategy. Structural racism. We talk about systems and policies and legacies of racial oppression, right? We don't get to sort of use this sense of, I can call you a name and you can call me a name and oh, we can all be a little bit racist and ignore legacies and systems of oppression that have disenfranchised whole communities over decades and decades, right? This shows up in our housing policies, our wars on drugs, uh, environmental pollution, predatory loans, et cetera, et cetera. A quote from a strategist under uh, um, Nixon, the original war on drugs, where he says, not secretly recorded, said out loud in public, you understand what I'm saying. We know we couldn't make it illegal to either be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, Ehrlichman said. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. He's talking about the use of federal policy to deliberately disenfranchise whole communities and groups of people. That is racism. 
But there's a chasm in our understanding of what that is, right? In our public discourse, especially. Uh, I like this series by Nicholas Kristof, where he says, whites just don't get it. And he makes this attempt in these, these editorial pieces to represent the ways in which these structures and patterns show up. And the responses to some of this are things like, probably has something to do with their unwillingness to work. We can't fix their problems. If blacks are poor or in prison, it's all their fault. We all start from zero. They don't get it. They don't understand. So we are thinking about ways to use an immersive experience of racism in virtual reality to help people better understand the realities of racism. And we're targeting people who espouse beliefs of racial equality and racial justice but don't understand racial inequality and racial injustice. They don't understand how that shows up in society and in people's lives. Maybe we can help them. So we created an experience. <laughs> That's a multi-scene life course experience through the lens of a black male named Michael Sterling. And you're able to experience Michael's life at age seven when he's being discriminated against in his elementary school classroom, being yelled at by a white teacher and put in the corner while looking at the other kids continue to play, who are engaging in the exact same behavior he engaged in, but were not punished. You're able to be Michael at age 15, leaving the apartment to go to a basketball game where his mother asked him to stop because she can see on the news that the police are looking for someone who's wearing something very similar to him and ask him to change. He resists, he resists, but he, because he's running late for the basketball game, and she reminds him to not forget what happened to his brother last year. He changes, and he still goes outside, jaywalks to try and catch his bus, and is accosted by a police officer. At age 30, you're in a Goldman Sachs S very white space with white founders on the walls and white magazines, or magazines that are covered with white faces being ignored um, and assumed uh, to be certain things by the people who are conducting your interview. And at age 50, we ask you to think about your life in reflection as you look at your face in the mirror, thinking about the things that have happened over your life course. I was asked to emphasize a bit the process by which this was developed, the process by which this was designed. It started with this brainstorm of writing down all the things, the racial sentiments, the emotions, the nuances that we think are difficult to convey, and really starting to think about how we can translate this in a virtual space. And I should say that when I originally wrote the proposal to fund this work, I had never used virtual reality. I didn't actually know what was possible, and in some ways that worked to my advantage. We also use empirical data. I am a scientist, so we use data that we have on stop and frisk practices, disciplinary practices in schools, hiring practices and discrimination, et cetera. But we also value personal narratives where people are talking about their feelings and emotions and perspectives on racism. We went onto trains and buses and sidewalks and elevators to try and capture movement and nuance using virtual reality technology. And we use that to elaborately construct these layered scenes, many parts of which that many people, when they put on the headset, may not notice or experience, but it comes together into this holistic sense of this is what it feels like in a way that I hope reads is very authentic. It was really thinking about movement and who's occupying space in different moments and how are we using sound and light to correspond with the emotions we're trying to capture. We had to record actors on green screens, and then we placed them into computer-generated environments. So the police officers in the scene are shot in 2D film. The scene behind them is all computer-generated, and we mixed those media together. When we have you in virtual reality, for those of you who haven't used this technology, you can use hand controllers and the handset to look at your face in a mirror, and the hands move when you move, the head moves when your head moves, and you embody this experience. And we have empirical data that suggests when you have to look at this face that's different than your own in a mirror and see the movements mimic your own, you start to feel more like this person. You start to feel more like the things that they're experiencing are also happening to you. And again, we're using science to try and get a sense of how is this working, how effective is, is, it, is it or is it not, right? So we're thinking about is the experience that we've created any more or less effective than other forms of, say, traditional perspective taking in relation to not just empathy, right? We don't just want people to feel bad, but we want people to act and think differently. And can we create an experience that helps them to do so? 
we're also really, it's really important for us to think about being public facing. So we are now an official selection at the Tribeca Film Festival, but we're also thinking about ways that we can engage with museums and uh, different community organizations. And I'm thinking specifically how I can collaborate with designers and educators to build a curriculum around this type of experience to further enhance what can be learned as a result of going through this type of experience. So this was developed with a very large team, interdisciplinary team of uh, really integrating psychology and social work and sociology, creative technology, art, and design. Again, my brain alone couldn't create or produce what we've been able to come up, come up with, and it was really important that I had this uh, interdisciplinary team and space to, to create this work, and I look forward to, to speaking with you more about it. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, I want to <laughs> say, I just sort of make this statement about why this type of approach is important, that, and, and really it's rooted in this belief that racial justice requires that we understand racism, um, and not an understanding that emerges from intellectual exercise or even in the consumption or production of science, but rather a visceral understanding that connects to spirit and body as much as reason. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I, I didn't know how to switch this on. I'm from Africa. We don't have this thing. <laughs> That's your excuse for everything, right? <laughs> my, my name is Tao Tawengwa, and uh, I've got an easy job. Uh, these guys have presented fantastic work. Uh, my perspective looking at the work, and I've tried to read a little bit in the last uh, few weeks, uh, and I ended up getting lost in your, uh, in all your work, because you know it's sort of like it's really deep, but uh, it also um, it says a lot of stuff about where I'm coming from, different contexts. But I think you guys are dealing with issues that are quite universal. So um, we don't have a lot of time, and um, I'm going to try to just uh, maybe ask one or two questions that uh, try to sort of tie what you guys are doing together, but maybe give you the opportunity to fill in uh, some of the stuff you couldn't get into uh, a little deeper. Um, to start off with, uh, with, with you, Seku, um, just um, reading through, I read uh, one of your papers um, where you were talking about the origins uh, of hip hop, and you sort of like tried to frame it as you were explaining um, uh, in the context of the built environment. Uh, I think you didn't really get into that I think at length, and I think it's so key to some of the stuff that you are trying to do. So that's the first question. Uh, and the second question, just as a follow on to that, is uh, the potential, uh, your experiments, to jump into uh, build form. What are you thinking about that? Yeah, so, so there, there are a lot of um, kind of, let's say there are multiple narratives of, of the, where hip hop began and, and what the genesis of hip hop is, um, and what I've, come to really um, uh, start to, to land on is that, you know, these, these, these kids, they're, they're all hit high school kids, right? They're really high school kids that didn't have art or drama or dance in their, in their high school curricula. So they decided, you know, and, and that's something that's, um, it's inherently suppressive to kind of strip all that stuff away from young adults growing up and they need uh, creative expression in one way or another. So, um, uh, and, and especially black folks, like people who are they, young black and Latino kids in, in New York, and they just need to you know, find a way of saying who they are. They have an identity. And uh, that, luckily for us, was, um, came out in a way that was really, really powerful and really, really expressive and colorful and dynamic and, and engaging. 
Um, so uh, that is, that's the narrative that I like to go to. And it's not the one about these kids were all poor, because they weren't all poor. They, they're all from, um, they're kids of working class uh, families. So all of their parents worked, all their parents were putting them through school. Um, and uh, or a narrative that they were all kind of about rebellion and political action. No, they're just like, I just want to put my name on the wall. You know, <laughs> I just want to be an artist. Um, and I just want to have fun and go to parties. Uh, so that kind of uh, attitude is, is something that um, uh, I, I'm really trying to hold at, in, in grounding all the work that I do. Um, and I, I'm really searching for something as, um, as a scientist, as, as Courtney said, and, and as a kind of a, 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 a forensic pathologist of, of in, in certain ways. Um, but I'm also just a, a designer. I just want to make cool shit. I just want to make things that look really beautiful. Um, and uh, and I, I don't really have... A, um, Hip hop also has another kind of layer to it, which is about authenticity and about who's in and who's out. And it's like about no rules, but it's, it's all a lot of rules, like really strict rules. And um, so I don't go around telling people that I'm a hip hop architect, right? Um, I'm just trying to be an architect. Um, and if, if what comes out of me is studying hip hop and then it looks something like what hip hop architecture might look like, then that's kind of a happy coincidence. Um, I, I'm not trying to uh, get to a place where I say I label every single thing that I do uh, hip hop architecture. Um, I, uh, I, I really believe that um, the kind of work that will be hip hop architecture will probably not come from anyone who is a, an architect, not come from anyone who's a licensed architect, because architecture has its own kind of hangups and structures and strictures that, that kind of uh, prevent it from being anything close to what hip hop wants to be. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Courtney? Um Looking at, uh, I, I, it's, it's a pity that uh, there's no way to demo this here because I'm sure a lot of people would have loved to. Um, can you sort of um, maybe get a, a little more into the process? Um, because I was thinking about, um, you, you have an experience like this in virtual space. Is the assumption that um, I, not assumption, I guess, uh, the, the idea that uh, somebody comes out of there knowing a little more uh, from having worn somebody else's skin, almost literally, um, and has a, I guess, an opera moment and light bulb, you know, they are enlightened somehow and see things differently. Or is, the, is this just the beginning of, I suppose, a much longer process? What is necessary, actually, to get the change that's necessary? Yeah. Um, I, you know, my hope is that the way I've been describing it is that for, for people for whom this is part of their social reality and they know this, that they'll come out of this experience saying, that's it exactly. And for people for whom this is not part of their social reality will come out and say, I had no idea, right? I want them to come out understanding that they don't know anything yet and that they should be listening more and paying attention to data more. Uh, than they currently are. So for me, it's a hope that this is a starting point in opening up a listening and being quiet uh, sort of moment rather than I now know exactly what it's like to be a black male. You know, you don't actually, right? And so, uh, and that's not the intent. We could never possibly create that for you. But so the point is that maybe it opens people up more, um, especially given our target population, which is really sort of self identified white liberals who often, again, espouse this belief of uh, racial justice and racial equality. And, and, I, and I believe that, right? But they don't, again, they don't always get racial injustice and racial inequality. And so uh, this is a moment for them to listen and to learn and to be more open and to be more effective advocates and allies through their learning process. Um, just to follow on, have you, have you considered the other story? Uh, a racist white man? as the avatar, because you know, conversations are two-way. Uh, so um, the, um, these immersive virtual reality technologies, they sort of tend to give you one view. 
and I wondered uh, what the potential to actually learn about the other from the, you know, would be uh, just in terms of your, is it something that uh, you think would have any yeah, so it was important even in the experience that we've, that we've already created to juxtapose whiteness to the experience of Michael, right? So it's not just Michael. Michael is always in the face of whiteness and encountering whiteness. Yeah. So that is always there and a part of the experience that we've already created. But we're also developing a series of pieces with The Guardian and uh, Oculus through Facebook on whiteness explicitly. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a series of virtual reality pieces that will address that theme more, more directly. Okay. Uh, Brendan. Um, you, you, you started off talking about mental health. It's obviously something that's very key to sort of your, like your view, uh, you know, of your work, and I suppose you know your approach to the world. It's it's such a and um, um, I'm supposed to hold this close to me. Um, is um, your your project that uh, you, you have been doing? You're wearing one of the t-shirts. I don't know if if, if everybody noticed. Uh, what is the the the, the, the larger uh, kind of intent of the project? Is it awareness? Uh, and uh, how is that idea of um, being very conscious of um, the issues around mental health uh, personally affected? Actually, a lot of the work that we have done, even though it's not directly linked to that. So those two. Yeah. So. Um for me, it is awareness. Um, I, f I found out a, a little bit, not the entire story about what went on, what, what happened to my father earlier in life. And growing, it be, I had a, developed a fear of, of uh, losing it, of not uh, having it all, like, you know, um, or whatever that means. And that's in, in, in these abstract terms. And, you know, how I thought about it at the, at the time. So I was kind of living with the, you know, the fear of this. So as I, in stressful times where I was experiencing a lot of anxiety, I was like, you know, um, really, really living with that and look to art as ways to express. So that's what a lot of the art, like a lot of the characters were really about. I just, cause I, I understood that um, you can't withhold, you, you know, you can't hold things in and not express what was going on. Um, at, a, at a young age, for whatever reason, that you know, that eventually those will, those things will will come out or lead to other other things. Um, so that was my experience, really coming up and and being aware of that. So I do. It is a huge part of my work, and it's a huge part of how, how I take on a lot of things. If not, you know, everything I, I think about, it, I look at it from that perspective. And my whole um, goal is is just to for us to develop a greater sense of empathy for people who may be experiencing this. Um, and if you don't have anybody in your family that you actually speak to that is going through a mental illness or going through some type of crisis, you don't have any uh, an anchor in that. And, and you, you see people on the street, you walk right past them, or you, you think if somebody's acting out, they're doing it, it's, it's about you, or it's personal to you, or that person's crazy, or whatnot. So it's just important to me that we we understand those things, and um, we don't cut off our communication with people who might be dealing with, with that for lack of understanding, for fear of what might happen. Um, because of what happened with my father when I would, throughout my life, when I would encounter other professionals, that, that was, it was clear that they were dealing with something, um, uh, I would react and respond very differently, which would lead to me having a lot more personal conversations with those people. And, and um, really d developing a different type of and a deeper relationship with those individuals. So I, I just think it's important. I think we just we need to, to know about it. We need to develop more conversation about it. I mean, the depression is the main thing that we, we talk about, right? Depression and suicide. That's like the, at the forefront of all like the mental health issues. I feel like that people talk about. So when uh, when Logic did that performance on the I think it was the MTV Awards, he um, he spoke to depression and um, suicide. He, he had a number of the phone number, you know. They came up on, on um, at the end of his performance saying, if you're dealing with this or somebody's dealing with this, call in and you know, get some help or speak to somebody. So I know I'm giving a long, really long answer. But yeah, that's, that's what I, you know, I, I would say to it. it. It really is about awareness, and it's really about um, having these conversations that might be difficult to have, because uh, these people aren't making up these things, or people not being weak or whatever. You know, it's, it's real. You know. 
Uh, uh, just, uh, it occurred to me that um, I think, Courtney, some of your work uh, that you have done before was very much around, um, I suppose, the, if, if I get it right, uh, the mental health impact of a lot of these microaggressions. And um, so that, I thought, related in a very interesting way to um, what Brendan's work, some of it is, is, is covering. Um, and there's a designer, scientist. I wondered then, since we're at a design conference, uh, what, is, um, what is design opened up uh, or actually, on some level, um, found it difficult to, you know, uh, to, to facilitate in your process because I think you're sort of like dealing in this dimension that requires uh, the science, but also it's got a big um, uh, sort of like built environment uh, design input, uh, albeit virtually. So. How has design been part of that process? And also, Brendan, just to sort of like link you two up, what is the, um, the, the work that Courtney is doing? Like, what does that say to you, like, given your, yeah? So, so for me, you know, what the, what the empirical work indicates or sort of suggests is that uh, these personal experiences with racial discrimination, right, being called a name, being followed in a store, being treated as less intelligent, et cetera, that those things are quite detrimental for your health, physical, mental health, et cetera. And then the argument I make, though, is that that's really just a slice of what's stressful about being a person of color in this country, and we have to do a better job of actually validating and visualizing our experiences in a way one, to just validate those experiences, but also to better understand how it affects things like mental health and physical health. Um, and for me, that design component has come in through trying to build an environment and build an experience that is real for me and then trying to represent it in some way. And I realized very quickly I was out of my depth. This is not how my brain has been trained to work to create sound and visual and light and these sorts of things. And so for me, having artists and designers as a part of this process has been critical, especially when we could connect around the experience that we're trying to, to represent, right? So it's not just about the, the science and what the data say, it's actually saying the science and data don't actually capture what is real and, and visceral, and how can we use um, this, this medium to help us capture some of that. So I think it's, 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 it's critical. Um, but and, you know, I think a lot of us also don't understand how much living in these racially toxic environments damage our bodies and damage our minds. And you know, the, you know, to get on my health spiel for just a little bit, um, blacks in this country have an earlier onset, faster progression, and earlier death from the 15 leading causes of disease. And that holds even after you account for education and income. Black women with a college degree have worse birth outcomes than any other racial ethnic group at any other level of socioeconomic status. Black men with a college degree have the same mortality risk as white men who have graduated from high school. And that, that, that's not explained by exposure to violence. Our health is so important and is constantly being threatened. And when your heart rate goes up and doesn't come down when you go to sleep, eventually that becomes heart disease, right? And so figuring out, uh, I was just telling someone else that, that there are sort of two types of people in the world. A wise woman once told me, there are people who solve the problems of their discipline and there are people who solve the problems of the world. And the people who solve the problems of the world require those intersections of art and science and design and engineering, et cetera, if we ever want to really stand a chance of doing anything about these really complex social issues. Can I, can I just interject here? Can I just say that I, I, I love the fact that we're at a design conference and we're talking about people and humanity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because that, that, that's really the crux of what this, this last piece that I wrote about the oppressive grid is about, is that the, the whole um, modernist and postmodernist project was about removing identity, removing people from, 
from design, from designing architecture and designing spaces, and and all of us who came up through the mid '90s uh, in at at, at uh, schools like this or at Cornell, we learned, we got programmed to to love the the formal aspects of of design and architecture, and love the grid as this like really powerful tool for us to 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 use in all of our designs. But it's 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 not about people at all. Like it's removing people. Like uh, you know, you, you look at any architecture magazine and you and you see no people in the photographs <laughs> of the architecture. And uh, and uh, we 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 have to really and, and and it's a radical proposition nowadays as an architecture professor to say that. Um, I believe that architecture is about people, and I don't know why that's so radical. It's like it's, it's like uh, um, uh, it should be second nature, and and I don't get it. So I, I love that that we it takes just like it took the the high school kids in living in the this modernist nightmare to like create this 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 social cultural movement, I think it takes black people in design to have these conversations that really put people back into architecture. I, I, um, I wanted to, I, I, in, in uh, your work, Courtney, I, I, man, it's, I see so much, like, <laughs> just, just possible. It makes me think about simulation theory, like, uh, um, and, and it, it being sort of a, a simulation, and then I think about, um, I can't remember the sociologist's name, but I think in, in the 50s he, uh, he, uh, he did an experiment and uh, lived out a certain um, amount of time as a, as a black man. Black, by, black like me? The I think so. And, and you know, he, he wrote about it and all of that stuff, right? But that's, that's a very removed experience versus kind of being in that seat and, and being in that and having that real experience. So I, I don't know. I think it's great. I think so many ideas and so much can can come from it. And, and I, I think about that one Bruce Willis movie, Surrogates. Like you know, like even that, like really experiencing the world and people in that way. Um, so I, I'm fascinated to see see where it goes. I can see it in in the MoMA. You know what I mean? <laughs> like honestly, um, and because I think it it says something. Um, I don't know it's, it's 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 really striking at the same time. So I think I think, I think it's cool. Is that what you're kind of yeah. asking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We run out of time. Uh, okay. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> thank you, Sekou. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan. Um, just 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 to add quickly. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for to take questions from the audience. But uh, these three are available. So please. Rush them. <laughs> there will be photos and everything from Brendan. So yeah, please uh, let's uh, give these guys a round of applause. Thank you.